Ending all, reading and writing floats on a sea of talk by James Britton. On this note and on behalf of Council of SMEs and Indian Institute of Finance, it is my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to you all. Your presence makes us very happy. Thank you for joining us in this today's webinar on digital rupees and cryptocurrency. I convey my regards to both of the speakers, Professor Raman Agarwal, Professor of Finance and Director of Director at Institute of Finance, and Mr. Shokla, Vice Chairman, Council of SMEs. A very warm welcome to both the renowned speakers and delegates who could took out their valuable time for this webinar. We are honored to have you all with us, wishing this webinar a, a very informative and enlightening. So with this small thought, I ask Ashok sir to take this forward with Taman sir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Gurmit. Um, on behalf of the Council SME, I want to welcome all of you. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Amon Agarwal, he is known as the, he is recognized as an expert on the cryptocurrency and written a number of scholarship uh, papers on this topic. Cryptocurrency is one of the hottest topics today. Particularly, it became very popular today speech when she talking about when she talked about taxing gains on the cryptocurrency profits and intro and introduction of digital currency in the coming years in bc ago bc barring system was introduced for exchange of goods and services later currency was introduced as a medium exchange of goods and services First metal coins, later paper currency. Around 1970, in US, plastic currency, also known as the credit card, was introduced when one doesn't have to carry any paper money. Now, hardly anybody carries any paper money. I hardly carry any paper money, just a plastic card. I can go from point A to point B, any place in the world. Most of the people, cryptocurrency is unknown quantity and that was subject to skepticism and fear. I'm sure that Amon, with the vast knowledge in cryptocurrency, which keep us all educated and shed light on this mystery. To start it, Amon, what is currency and why there's a need for the digital currency? CBTC, by RBI, as been mentioned by FM in the Union Budget 2022. Thank you, Akshok, uh, for that warm welcome and for uh, Council SME to have organized this uh, conference on digital currency and the way forward and how things are going to be there. Uh, you know, I think you did give a brief introduction of the way currency got initiated. The prime purpose, as you rightly pointed out uh, in your introduction, was a reason for medium of exchange as money is called for and we did start with the barter system uh, you know as you pointed out rightly but then we did move on to uh, a currency or a token which could be utilized for an exchange or for goods and services and you know so the prime purpose of any money or currency as we refer to is uh, the medium of exchange but then it needs to have a few additional features which got embedded in it uh, you know almost thousands of years back when the currency as a form came into picture or money came into picture first is the that it, it has become a unit of account and store value in it so and then there has to be someone who embodies it or recognizes it and becomes the custodian of that particular uh, money or currency as you may call it now this is where it becomes important if you most of you will remember when we had coins or leathers or stones or woods or you know silver or gold even plastics uh, coins were there uh, stones were there and so and so many other forms have taken place 
all of them had to be stamped by the respective kingdom when they were initiated and that is where it became the factor that who was the producer of this currency and how could it be produced and how could it not be produced so there was this store of value which came into picture the the origination and that's where the whole journey of money or currency came into picture over the years as you rightly pointed out we have moved to paper currency we have moved to uh, you know plastic currency uh, in the form of credit cards but then even despite the fact that uh, plastic cards were introduced way back in 1970 as you rightly pointed out in the united states by two one two major giants which are the payment gateways for some of these cards across the globe uh, but they still could not uh, seep into in terms of replacing uh, the paper currency or taking away cash from there as a medium of exchange and the prime reason was that most of these cards uh, were pegged with the fact that there has to be a credit worthiness for someone to get some of these cards whereas when it comes to currency the credit worthiness is the the worthiness of the person holding that currency and actually that currency gives the worthiness to the person and the valuation the financial valuation of that person or that firm or the organization or a state as a matter of fact so you know the plastic cards the credit cards could never emerge as a medium of exchange or a token of exchange but a medium for transaction is what they became but also for a large segment a higher segment of the society or upper middle class of society as against a common man per to so as to say now the there has been an emerging debate and existence which has come into framework of something called cryptocurrencies which i in particular and my co-authors which have been working on it for 2016 onwards refer to it as crypto products uh, because these are ones which are tokens which are created by uh, private individuals or organizations or institutions or companies which have actually just created them with the help of uh, you know computer based technological framework which is using mining and then they use blockchains in terms of collaborating it but then it is not embodied or structured in any form where it becomes a true medium of exchange because please understand a true medium of exchange is not when you have 2 3 4 10 15 people or maybe even a lack of people exchanging that particular product uh, you know a casino which we see in movies i have not seen one in reality but i have seen in movies as they show uh, there is these chips which are used for exchange on tables in terms of trading value and everything and each chip has a different color and different structure given a different valuation uh, that does not become although in that particular zone and there are large huge casinos in california and some of the other countries uh, where they are huge in structure so in that zone that is the floating currency in that particular from work no normal money can be used in terms of playing or doing any activity in those casinos but then this is still not a medium of exchange despite the fact that hundreds and thousands of people use them on a daily basis that have never come to be as a medium of exchange because a medium of exchange is when you are looking at uh, buying goods and services even the most smallest component from the market it needs to be bought and so that money can be utilized as a medium of exchange and that's where the importance of money comes and the fact that it needs to be store value and so and so now you also ask the particular question in this what what was the need of digital currency coming into play and the fact that uh, you know why is it so important now it, i think it is very important in the right time i'm happy that the the government as well as the finance minister has talked about uh, this in the union budget uh, where she introduced the fact that the rbi will introduce a digital rupee in 2022 23 in the in the financial year 2022 23 beginning from 1st april till 31st march 2023 they will introduce the digital rupee and in addition to that they, she also talked about the tax component now i'll come to the tax part in a second later but when it comes to the digital rupee it is the way we have been proposing from 2016 onwards in various works which have been presented at global forums across the globe within the country and tv channels and radio channels including the doordarshan and others where we have talked about the fact that the central bank needs to come out with a currency and you they don't need minings or mines to create them they only need to change the mode as has been done in the past when it was changed from leather to gold or silver or or metal or wood 
or uh, or even paper similar is the more way you need to change from paper to digital and there has to be a structure of accounting and creating security frameworks in place so that the digital payment can take place and fortunately uh, the rbi has been working on it uh, some of one of our works which got published in finance india uh, in 2000 june 2018 immediately after that rbi constituted a committee or uh, based on our work and talked about creating it and couple of months back we also saw the fact that they the prime minister is launched a system wherein bypassing all payment gateways you can actually transfer uh, money from one person to the other this is a technology which is required when it comes to digital rupee like we are exchanging cash so if i need to pay 10 rupees to buy a bottle of water i can actually pay 10 rupees and get that bottle of water similar is the case that without using any of the gateways that are present today we should be able to transfer that 10 rupees in a digital way to the other person and that will remain in a digital format need not be converted in a paper format ever and that would not go to the structure as it goes today so this is where the need for digital framework came into picture and we have seen the emergence of digital transactions in particular whether it is in terms of investment whether it is in terms of common man using it in the last two and a half years in particular since we saw the emergence of covid and the corona virus now we talked about the taxation framework i'll just like to hint on that and maybe we can take it a little later you see what nirmala sitaraman ji has talked about is 30% tax on virtual assets please understand and i like tell my uh, listeners and your audience here that it is virtual assets it is not cryptocurrencies or crypto products as i refer to and not like the bitcoins or ethereum and others it is virtual assets virtual assets is a much wider term and it comprises of such crypto products but it also comprises of you might have heard and seen the etfs the paintings which are being sold across the globe in the last one and a half years for millions and billions of dollars in digital uh, framework of performance similarly patents today are something which large number of organizations and individuals have which are in virtual platform again there is no need of physical copy which is given out it's a virtual asset in terms of patent which you gain and you have a right to sell and buy those patents similar are there are similar assets which are in virtual format which can be bought and sold so this 30% tax which is there is on that the difference is this only takes into account the value you have purchased at so whatever you are selling at minus the purchase value whatever revenue generated from there you pay 30% tax on it plus she has introduced 1% tds on transfer whenever there is a transfer suppose you are not selling the asset but just transferring it to your kids and kins or anyone else and there is a transfer from one place to the other then also 1% tax is where you taunting to know how does this particular framework which they want to launch the digital rupee in will differ from the pre existing digital transactions which are already taking place is that yes is that correct yes. ashok yes that's you that's see, correct i'm happy you asked this question because you see it's important to be understood when we're looking at digital currency and this is what a lot of people have apprehension on when it a central bank launches it first of all you know if it is the same way of transaction which we are doing today when we use different upi apps to transfer money from a to b and the difference is when you use a upi app it goes through multiple payment gateways in even go to the rbi window to actually get transacted into the framework so they apart from digital platform prints which are being created you know it actually goes through different banking systems and then goes to the other person's account here you you are actually transferring money in the digital plat digital money in directly from one to b actually directly transfer from one to the other it does not need to read route through the banking system or banking framework okay. only when you want to transfer this money to your bank account would this money go to your bank account otherwise like cash gets transferred from me to you the same way the money will get transferred from uh, you know me to you in a digital platform or digital uh, structure and this is where they have already tested the technology couple of months back when prime minister launched it but they still have to do random security checks and create a framework where they can be no lapse or this money cannot be evaded away by someone once it goes from one person to the other okay and that that's a great uh, that's a good um, yeah. a great explanation professor agarwal may i ask a question please professor agarwal 
I have no problems. Go ahead. Go ahead. Professor Agarwal, Krishan Kalra here. May I ask you a question? Please go ahead, Krishan Kalra. Yeah. No, no, you had, you had just explained in answer to what Mr. Laha raised the question that in case of the normal digital transactions, the transaction has to go through a banking institution, RBI or some other institution it has to go to. Whereas in case of cryptocurrencies, it is directly transferred. What I'm not clear about is that there has to be some money. If I am to transfer, say, 10 rupees to you, now how would I do that unless in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a holding instrument or something, I have those 10 rupees with me? How will I transfer that? So there has to be some kind of a banking uh, uh, arrangement has to be there. Only then the money would go out of that. Maybe, you know, for example, I use Paytm. Now I first transfer money to Paytm. Then from Paytm, I can send it to anywhere. Or UPI or whatever it might be. How does crypto work? I mean, where is that money lying? Correct. You see, first of all, uh, I would like to distinguish between digital currency, which they normally call as CBDC or central bank digital currency and cryptocurrencies, which are already floating by the name of cryptocurrencies like bitcoins and others. I normally refer to them as crypto products because they don't have an underlying asset. They are not uh, their, their origination, their final destination, their holdings are not known which country and where it is. Headed. Firstly, secondly, you are right. You see, you have to use a medium. Currently, whatever technology we use uses a medium of transfer when moving from one place to the other, when money is transferred from one person to the other person, it uses a medium. Later on also, it is not as of now clarified by them, but that's what they have proposed, is that it will go from one wallet to the other. So the, the wallet will have to be there, but the medium of exchange, which currently uses an UPI-based structure, where it has to go through the banking framework, will not be there. And this is where they're developing the technology. Like today, you have to use Wi-Fi to actually do all these transactions. So there are some people who have developed technology where you don't need to even use a Wi-Fi. So you can transfer money without using Wi-Fi as well. So they are developing, they have already, they are testing this technology where they can actually transfer. So if I need to pay you something, I transfer it to you into your wallet. If it is a bank account, then it has to go to the banking framework. But if it goes into your uh, whatever framework we are looking at, it will go like from my wallet, current wallet to your wallet directly. And it does not need to use those UPI platforms as of now. This is what is being proposed when it comes to digital currencies, whether it is launched by India or even other countries which are working at, including China and United States, where they're looking at replacing the cash, the way cash functions, the same way the digital currency has to function. The only difference will be here that they would be in print, the transfer in print, which will always get created because in a digital platform, whether you're using a wallet, because it is not a physical wallet for me and physical wallet for you. So whether we're using a mobile based system or some other based system, it will have to have a wallet and which will be in a digital structure, which will have to have some kind of an operational approval from the Reserve Bank. Uh, as a result, there can be always tracks, which is not the case with cash. Where they can be not being transferred, but the direct transfer will certainly be there. Still. If it's a direct transfer, sir, from your wallet to my wallet, or my wallet to your wallet, and no banking institution comes in the picture, then isn't it something like what happens on the dark web? Then no one knows about it. What money we are exchanging, and how can how can the government then tax that money? Are correct. There any Very income correct. Arising out of that? Very correct. You see, first of all, what happens in the dark web or with these crypto products, which is there, is that there is a place where they store that we do not know where exactly it is stored. Who is the creator of that particular product? It is not known who is the creator of that product. Who is transferring to whom? Like recently uh, in Rohini, there was a gentleman, a businessman who had crores of worth of these uh, crypto products, which got stolen, got transferred over a click of a button to multiple locations across. Now, no one could think that someone in a small location like Rohini could be holding crores of worth of these products. Now, that is not going to be there. They will be it's like you have your cash. Where are you going to have your cash from? It is going to be an accountable source. So it has to be accountable at all. And it has to be it has to be something which is by the, the government. So this particular currency transaction, this whole thing will be controlled and monitored by the government and that's why in our work which we have proposed is an m5 money supply measure to go about taking this digital currency along with the 
ஸ்பீக்கிங் <laughs> Ashok sir you are on mute okay i'm sorry <laughs> okay um how is the digital currency by rbi different from the cryptocurrency floating and traded in the market for last 12 years around the line for 12 years yeah this is ashok what i was trying to actually explain to what even krishan had asked krishan kalra had asked about the fact that you know how would it be different uh, from what has been happening in the dark web uh, you know and uh, i'm happy that we also saw a recent uh, article today morning twice two articles in fact one was about the way uh, you know the government is looking at the enforcement directorate is looking at how cryptocurrencies have been utilized uh, in the in for terrorism and other activities uh, which we did talk about using hawala transaction which we talked about in 2016 paper that this will be forming a, a base of trans, uh, you know transaction and transfer you see please understand as i said before uh, the medium of exchange is either an exchange which is listing that particular crypto product or cryptocurrency like bitcoin and others or it is uh, that particular framework or that wallet which is created by them them which they say as a ledger which keeps a record of where you hold them and then you transfer it so i give you the code you can actually take that code from me change that code and automatically that money gets transferred to your to your account so it is not clear as to who transfers to whom where does it get transferred from who is the owner where exactly is it lying it is somewhere in the cloud now the digital rupee which is being introduced by the government of india uh, hopefully this year as uh, nirmala sitaraman ji said would be first of all backed by the reserve bank of india very important secondly it is going to be in rupee it is not something which will be traded like the crypto products are being traded and every day you see a jump of 10000 15000 5000 and so on so forth those kind of jumps and are not doesn't happen in currencies they can be in products but not in currencies so this is where the rupee will be there so the value of rupee if it is 1 rupee it will remain as 1 rupee only now international value may go up and down the purchasing power of that may go up and down like the rupee value goes up and down in a normal course you know against us dollar or against euro and so on and so forth but the rupee and if something happens tomorrow we know the originator in this case is the reserve bank and they don't need to do it by mining they just need to change what we already have seen and practice is a digital form you see most people you get your salary most employees in your salary get it from one bank to the bank gets transferred from one point to the other they don't get even if it is a check which was used in the past you don't actually get to see those lakhs of crores of rupees which get transferred in terms of money payments made to as pays to people in large organization even small organization it is already a large chunk of it has become digital it's a question of recognizing the fact that we can hold that in a digital format also and this is where the digital rupee will come handy for rbi in com- holding that money in terms of digital so it will not be converting to cash there would be ways of getting it converted to cash if you want to but it will remain in a digital form now those wallets who will create where will they get created is still not very clear as i said but as i said there is a delay. uh omon you are mute yes amon sir you are on mute another important factor which is there in case of money which i forgot to answer and let you know before is that you see when we say rupee the strength of a rupee or the strength of a dollar or the strength of a euro or a pound where does it come from the total assets of a country whether privately held or publicly held are actually the ones which are backing that currency if you might remember in the greece debacle which happened about 4 5 years back the greece since it had embodied the euro and the ecb was the only custodian of printing money or giving money 
and since they were in a problem they could not go about printing the central bank in greece could not go about printing money so they had nothing else but to go about first selling their public assets and if need be even private assets to actually stabilize the economic activity in the country so similarly in any country whether i am holding a house or a building or a particular asset like gold or silver or diamond plus everybody in this country which is holding it is the real value of that currency the total real value of that currency which it comes from and this is very important this particular value was trying to be created when venezuela launched the petro dollar based on petroleum reserves but they did not have petroleum reserves that's why in about 8 to 9 months time it went bust now so they did try to create that based on our work where they said we have an asset value where it will drive the value from and hence we can reduce the petro dollar but then those reserves were not there so that's why it went bust but here when you are looking at a currency a money which is rupee or dollar it is backed by the whole nation's assets and that's where it, the store value comes from or the the real value of that currency comes from which is a clear cut differentiation between those crypto products which were launched in the last 12 years by various companies and those which are launched by a central bank or a government which is testifying and taking that legal you see if you take up a note even a note any note except for 1 rupee note where it says printed by the ministry of finance all other currency notes says guaranteed this much money is guaranteed now the value of money may go down because of the purchasing power but the guarantee is there that means if something happens tomorrow like 500 rupees are demonetized 1000 rupees are demonetized they give you back the same amount of money you did not lose a single penny on it so this is so where one question okay. yeah sir i just okay. wanted to know uh, what would happen to the current cryptocurrency as you know bullion is a bitcoin a legal tender in that country also the baseline technology sorry am i okay. no no can Hello? can you please uh, uh, please hold your question little later i'll open up the floor sure sir okay sure sir okay sure. okay Thank you. uh i know that um in us cryptocurrency legal so far i know in india it's illegal today as of today how many kind countries have banned cryptocurrencies or products and why i'm happy you asked this again because you know uh, ashok you will be surprised to know the us fed has very clearly said earlier this uh, last year mid that we have not legalized any crypto currency or product they have only said that we have not banned them so they are allowed to be traded purchased by rich people and you know people of value who want to use it for transaction or do activities in terms of holding it but they have said very clearly we have neither legalized it but we have not banned it there are over 74 countries including the ecb large number of european countries in africa in other smaller countries india which have actually banned or restricted the transfer even china as a matter of fact has banned it in terms of doing and they are also launching their own digital currency which they have been structuring for almost 2 years now the fed also came out last year towards the end saying that the fed will also launch its own central bank digital currency and what will be the fate of these crypto products which are already floating in the united states is again not clear as of today after the fed has said all this now please understand that in india the finance minister arun jaitley based on our speeches based on our works in 2016 and 17 he in his budget speech which is where you normally don't see this kind of mentions but in his budget speech and which we had been requesting all through 2017 that please the finance minister or the ministry must come out or the rbi must come out so that people don't lose money did say that cryptocurrency floating in india are not a legal tender after that various deputy governors of rbi even minister for state of finance for india has come out and said in the last two years that it is not a legal tender and the banks were restricted immediately in terms of people wanting to buy and sell however some of these big crypto exchanges and crypto products traders went to the supreme court in 2018 itself and they got a stay order partial stay order stating that we should be allowed to 
trade it in the exchange. That means people should be allowed to buy it like an equity or debt product they buy in an exchange. And the Supreme Court at that time allowed that partial framework, uh, giving them that leeway to go about trading and buying and selling. However, they did not even take a decision on whether it is a legal tender, whether it has underlying asset value. And recently, Nirmala Sitaramanji and even RBI governor in the last two weeks have come out and said very categorically that the, there is no underlying asset and it cannot be a legal tender. And in November 2021, Piyush Goel, through a parliamentary committee, submitted a cryptocurrency bill. Now, that particular document is not in public domain. So I cannot really give out as to what has been said there. And that particular bill was supposed to be tabled in the current parliament session, but they maybe have waited for the finance minister to announce what she announced. And maybe in the next parliamentary session, they will take a call on what will be the cryptocurrencies fate. So till that time, and given the fact that Nirmala Sitaraman had said 30% taxation on crypto products or virtual assets, I would say, it is clear that you can go about trading, you can go about selling, paying 30% if you want to legalize it, but it is still not clear whether they are legal, not legal. And in most countries, they have clearly banned them saying that they're not legal, but it is still being traded and in used by a large number of people as a medium of transfer from one place to the other in terms of payment, some legitimate, some illegitimate. Even I remember a lot of, there's an institute in New York, uh, which is studying Bitcoins and others and promoting them. And they are actually saying that large number of people who are actually working as workers in different countries, including United States, use this particular way to actually transfer their own funds, repatriate their funds to their families back home and use these products in terms of transferring, which is a very cheap. But that is where it is a big risk for the governments because there is no uh, way to go about tracing whether it goes into legitimate uh, structures or it goes into illegitimate structures or it creates havoc for a country or the humanity as a whole. And that is why even United States has made this stance recently when the Fed came out and said that they have not given any uh, clearance on the legal status. It is that, that we have allowed them to function and we have allowed them to pr move as products in the markets. Yeah. Um, isn't there some country, I, I saw that some country in South Africa, no, South America, made it a legal tender, Honduri or somebody else? El Salvador. El Salvador. El Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah. Yeah. El Salvador has made it a legal tender. Please understand, if you remember, I show a couple of years back, almost 15, 20 years back, in Latin America, they have been facing a lot of economic turbulence, whether it is Chile, Argentina, even Brazil, as a matter of fact, it is one of the largest economies in Latin America, Venezuela, all these countries have been facing a lot of economic turbulence. I remember during the seven, late 70s and the 80s, through IMF, the United States did take the measure of a dollarizing the country that the dollar will be prevailing, other currencies will go out. You see, some of these countries still have that pressure in terms of what should they go about doing. So many of these small countries, like we saw, you know, someone who frauded, the diamond uh, guys who frauded from India went to small countries and based themselves there. Now those countries welcomed them. But what happened after the money came, those countries also threw them out. Now many of them might lure some of these operators to go and function in their home country. And in any day, they can say, no longer is it a legal tender. Because it's the right of the government to go about doing You know, you are in the corporate business, you know how corporate rules and frameworks come out. Uh, you know, in autocratic countries or, or countries which have not so strong legal systems like we have in India. Here you still have a recourse, it's a democracy. But in most countries where democracy doesn't prevail, it is difficult to go question the government. So they can change the rules any day. So it is a small country, small zone, very small impact, even if they made it legal tender, doesn't really give that sanctity, doesn't prove, as I say, you know, in one word, these crypto products have no my bar. You know, it's a Hindi term which says no father, mother, where is it born? Where is it structured? Where is it going to land up? Who is going to regulate it is not known. And as a result, they still are a debatable question in terms of legality. Terrific. Thanks very much. Um, you know, I I read some places the cryptocurrency 
became very popular after 2008 financial crisis mm-hmm. when people people lost the interest people mm-hmm. lost the confidence in the banking system when bankers found mm-hmm. to be bankers mm-hmm. found to be involved in the financial irregularity 2008 financial crash in us was mainly because of some of the bank people at this talk about the bank so so do you think that as the confidence in the bank go up right now then cryptocurrency or still still will be the banks you know that's why the people are a little reluctant to quite reluctant to you know, trust the bank anymore no uh, could you repeat again ashok because partly i could not hear okay yeah. uh you know i read some articles that cryptocurrency became popular in us after 2008 financial fiasco when people found that banks are involved in that financial crisis they played some important role hmm. so that's why that, that con- lack of confidence in the bank led to the rise of the cryptocurrency hmm the question comes in is that will that happen again that's why that people don't want to use the bank anymore they they want to deal with it directly one person to other person no you you are correct that there could have been reason a lot of uh, you know regulators in particular and some of the economists have been talking about the fact that the emergence of cryptocurrency can be linked with the crisis uh, and that's where we saw the birth of these crypto products coming into picture but there is no clear cut evidence that it has been an outlay as a result of uh, you know because of the crisis which was there in the united states or the whole world as a world financial crisis which took place in 2007-8 uh, certainly there has been a deterioration of confidence in banks uh, whether it is the public at large or others but uh, this particular re- this particular product uh, which is floating in the markets whether launched by anyone uh you know it's a individual or a company uh, cannot uh, gain that trust and confidence because you see please understand uh, where does the trust and confidence come from there has to be someone who is an issuer of a product there has to be someone who takes the liability of that product tomorrow none of these features are there with any one of these products so you know certainly i can use it for transferring from a to b and b to c Uh, as long as it gets transferred it is fine it is like a hawala transaction but then really uh, can we go about saying that we have trust people who do hawala transactions even they don't have trust in the hawala transactions till the other party gets this money they are not very clear where is my money and the way hawala transactions used to work was a completely different framework one person will take the money at a location the person will call at the b location and ask that person to pay a specified amount of money they will settle their accounts at a later date it is not something which is happening in these products these products get stored in a a wallet or a framework which is maintained in as a ledger and then it gets transferred when i give you the code so once i give you the code you have access to those and you can change that code going forward and then that product money becomes yours to hold now where will you is it can it be used for changing can it be used for buying anything no you still have to change to a local currency whether it is dollars or pounds or euros or rupees or chinese yuan or japanese yen you will have to still change to a local currency if you want to go by buying selling and the product so the confidence which is seen is still not there and then who stops from hundreds of xyz coming up and starting these so called products who will take the legitimacy there has to be someone there has to be some body doing that and this is where in my opinion that trust and confidence cannot be the reason that there is a fall i fully endorse your view that there has been a fall extensive fall in the banking confidence post these crises and it is growing with the way we see these scams take place in the uh, you know in the uh, in the in the banking industry but still uh, the the you don't have an external any other factor where you can actually go on to another result this is still going to sustain itself the banks will still sustain themselves 
Yeah, okay. Um, there are a large number of, I, I think that your answer is well, uh, extremely well, well taken. There are a large number of IF studies, which have been in news, and read, I read most of some of them, on the formation of digital currency by central bank and cryptocurrency. Can you throw some lights on your findings and proposals made in the last six years? Yes, you see, uh, thank you for asking that. You know, we have the Institute of Finance have been working extensively on this platform uh, for almost six years now, 2016 onwards. And we have been proposing, and I'm happy some of those have been taken up by the government, and that will bring certain kind of stability in the structure. One was that we have been saying uh, that you need to introduce, the central bank needs to introduce this currency, whether it is the national government or the central bank of a country needs to introduce a digital currency. Second is what we suggested was that you don't need mining to be done. This is only a more change from paper to digital platform. And we already doing large chunk of business and transaction transfers of funds, which takes place in a digital platform. There needs to be a digital currency, which needs to be recognized. And so that one could transfer it without using some of these mediums, which are used directly from one to the other as the cash is done. Thirdly, we said that uh, to think of the fact that uh, these crypto products will disappear, they will coexist as is the case, whatever gets uh, unrecognized or deregularized goes underneath, it goes under the table. So we will see them as uh, moving in what, uh, you know, we did see uh, Christian talk about the dark web or the dark circles, where it will still get utilized in terms of transfer of good uh, payments uh, as a transfer of payments from one space to the other. But uh, we also said the fact that you, the central bank will have to look at a new money supply measure. As of today, we have M3. So we began with, this, uh, with M1, M2, M3, MB, M4, MZM, which are used as money supply aggregate measures across the globe by different central banks, different countries. Most popular is the M3, which looks at most of the components the check, transfers, uh, bank uh, uh, transfers, uh, coins, uh, notes, and so on and so forth. But we said if we have the digital currency, we will have to look at a new measure which takes into account, and that's where they will have to launch something called the M5 uh, to encompass this as a part of the money supply uh, structure so that money supply, which is very important in the measuring by any central bank to go about regulating the total flow of uh, money in the market can be done. And hence, these are some of the key points. We also uh, pointed out the fact that, you know, what you asked in the beginning, what is money? We trace back history and talked about the money, uh, the Karl Marx structure and others. Then we also talked about the framework of value of an asset in securities asset how do you define an asset and how does this particular crypto products defy these particular assets we gave regulatory prudence and others in our works to go about letting the government understand that they need to launch the digital currency and not a b and c who could be launching them as products thanks someone um you have though i i've read some of the paper they're wonderful papers i probably okay. already asked I will ask the audience to read some other papers. They're wonderful papers. Okay, moving on. Um, cryptocurrency is based on the blockchain and the wallets and everything else. What technology do you think is very expected to use for the digital currency proposed in union budget? Will it be blockchain or will it be something else? You see, I, whenever I have said about crypto products not being legal, or not appropriate. I have not talked about the technology. Blockchain is a technology. It's like a platform. Like, you know, you have software platforms, you have software platforms, which they are built on. So it's a platform where you can utilize. So blockchain has its own loopholes and there are generic blockchain structures which are there. Now, uh, as far as some information I've got from here and there from some ex RBI officers and all is that the RBI may build its own blockchain framework, our own structure a network based on which they will launch the digital rupee. Although uh, Nirmala Sitaramanji did mention of the usage of blockchains in the framework in terms of launching digital rupee, but would it be something which we have been seeing in the past or it will be a completely new technology base which they will build of their own 
I think is yet to be seen. Uh, there is no light on that, so I really cannot. I don't want to get into divulgence into developing new hyper theories on it. But they would certainly loot, and I have no problems. I say blockchain is a good technology, but it is not hundred percent secure even today. The fact that one of the exchanges was completely evaded away with all the crypto products for everybody who are holding it, and the next day they said all they had come back. The questions were asked to them; they did not answer. Where did they come back from? Did they newly create all those products, or what happened? It was not clarified by them. So this is where the worry is. But it is clear that the blockchains is a good technology, but still not 100% secure. And that's where RBI needs to look at whether they create their own framework, a phone platform using blockchains or black blockchain-based technology, or create a similar replica of that technology in terms of launching the digital rupee. On the side note. the lots of countries as you mentioned also like china us they are going to start a digital currency do you think that they all get together and come up with this one technology which everybody going to use it or they will have a different technology what's your guess no i think you know you are very right you see first of all all these three countries which you talked about india china and us you know they they have been working together at various platform but not working together at various platforms and there is a level of distrust which is developed in all these countries including russia as well although russia is not launching one but even russia as a matter of which is one of the large powers superpowers in the world uh, clearly as i say the, they are different economic zone powers so the india is a knowledge hub based power structure so given that uh, they don't see eye to eye and that level of trust deficit is certainly very high when it comes of building that platform if there is a consortium of banks or central banks like the bis the bank bureau of the bank for international settlement which is a independent uh, ngo which was started which does settlements for various banks similar kind of an organization comes up with a platform which is endorsed by all central banks then it could be possible but otherwise as of today what i see is that each one of them is actually going to build their own technology build their own platform learn from each other and see where they can complement each other but create their own the level of trust is fairly low when it comes to dealing with this technological framework and platform structure uh, whether it is united states india china russia or any other country as a matter of fact okay yeah thanks uh today there is a news where the Warren Buffett's partner Charlie Munger has called cryptocurrencies as BD venereal disease while they are floating and being traded in US for over, over a decade what your what your reaction what your comment about the Mr Charles Charlie Munger's comment do you subscribe uh, to that one you know it is uh, i think it's a important way or a message to people who are investing across the globe in some of these products warren buffet is one of the largest investors and is is respected like a gold figure in uh, you know uh, worldwide by all investment bankers and investors across the globe there is no one person who can say that what warren buffet has been saying they don't read really lead to or listen to and so on and so forth and so is the case with the warren buffet company where this gentleman happens to be a partner so you know to me it was a, a welcome surprise because now uh, there are certain uh, you know i would not call them negative but divergent views coming out from the united states first we first saw the fed coming out last year and earlier this year also then we saw one of the largest investment bankers which invests in huge chunk in most uh, big companies coming out and saying the fact that uh, you know this is not credible and i have been talking about it and it is should not be taken into account it should be done i think his words will ring the bell to most regulators across the globe including united states and especially the investor community i hope the message it goes loud and clear to them that if they are investing in some of these products they are investing at their own risk they should not take it that it is any kind of a currency and should be very cautious of such products which could just disappear any day okay thanks we i think my last question before i open the floor to any, everybody and anybody who want to ask questions 
for 15 minutes. Now, given that this is nothing to the cryptocurrency, given that we had just budget, we just, just made the budget presentation on the 1st February. What's your thing? What do you think of the budget? What's the future for the common man? How the economy, Indian economy is doing right now? I'm happy you linked it today, although it was not part of the, the talk the today, but I'm happy you did it because you see the budget 2022, in my opinion, is, is a very welcome and path breaking budget from a couple of perspectives. Firstly, it will add wings to 100, India at 100. You know, people say a budget, a budget document is not only a document which gives the accounts of a particular organization or a, or a country or a state. It is also supposed to give a reflection, a way of direction of where you're going. This particular budget has talked about the digital India. They've introduced digitalization in, in agriculture, digitalization in healthcare, digitalization in terms of even transacting to farmers directly at MSP. The 1.6 lakh crores to be transferred to uh, 2.83 crore farmers directly at under MSP. They are using digital platforms to actually make payment where they've told government offices that they must settle their bills within 10 days through digital platforms as soon as the bill is received. Now, these are some things which are very key and essential if you really want to move forward. If you want to really take India forward to the next level, take the digital flight. So in my opinion, the structuring of digital rupee, the structuring of digital frameworks which are being created in all modules to bring betterment to people at large, whether it is healthcare, agriculture, whether it is education, one channel, one TV, one channel, one class, something again, which will be a unique structure where they will be able to project education, diverging the gap between whether you are rich or poor, whether you're living in the border or you're living in a city like Delhi, you can have access to education at no cost through television structures, which are there, digital platform framework, which will be there. And this will not be only digital in terms of television, they will have you structures where maybe on YouTube or other platforms, they will put up their, their structure so people could access it off the hours also. So this is something which is very unique in my opinion. And the way she is projecting and doing things for the first time was a pure economic budget as against a political economic budget. Although in my opinion, a budget must have politics and economics. It has to be a good mix in my opinion. Although she did not touch on the politics because we thought there will be a lot of you know election-based sweets distributed, but none of them was distributed. But this was a clear indication to the world at large. You see, in India, we have received about 140 billion dollars in the last one and a half year. When the world is going through a recession, economies don't have funds, companies don't have money, we still received about six and a half to seven billion dollars per month. As foreign exchange, foreign exchange, foreign direct investment, a roughly about $42 billion in portfolio investment, largest of the last seven, eight years. Our foreign exchange reserves have risen to $650 billion and another $50 billion to, which are loans to neighboring countries. Now imagine those have been created on account of the kind of robustness this government has done in terms of reform processes, structures, creating transferring one market frameworks, Adhar implementation, Jam Trinity implementation, Jandhan account, 44.65 crore account holders of Jandhan account. Maybe few are false, I agree. Maybe they are always a mismatch which happens. But large number of them are real holders. Now imagine the kind of inclusion and the power it brings to the government. Now they are registering agriculture. You'll be surprised, Ashok. About 8.4 crores agriculturists are there. They've already registered roughly about 6 crore agriculturists, given them a unique ID. So now when it comes to giving benefits, it is not the rich agriculturists who are going to get benefit. To a small B land owner, if there is a subsidy or a benefit or loan waiver to be given, he will be given. A large land farm owner would not be given that benefit. There can be scrutiny of what benefits to be given to whom, which was not the case. Roughly about four and a half lakh to five lakh crores was being waived every year as farm waiver only for three and a half to four lakh crores as farm waiver only every year. For the last 15, 18 years, imagine the cost on the exchequer. Imagine the cost on the taxpayer like you and me, who has been bearing this cost of the agriculturists and rich, rich farmers were benefiting from it. Poorer farmers who needed the money were not even getting the money. 
Now they are trying to create a digital platform structure, regulation, transparency, accountability, inducing through it. And I think the digital will help create that level playing platform in terms of taking everybody on the same structure. We have seen with the way what credit cards, if you look at the annual reports of credit cards in 1970, 74, 75, 76 of MasterCard and, and Visa, where they said we will digitalize, revolutionize the world. Cash will disappear, but it could not disappear, as I said, because of the credit worthiness which was required. This jan the demonetization and the Jandhan account creation has ended up people moving to digital platforms. Today, most people use digital wallets and structures to go about making payments. The poorest of the poor. Imagine the level of security. A man on the street, what used to happen? He would earn the whole day whole cash. Then while going back, he will meet some friend or a burglar or someone else. Maybe he'll lose the money. He'll throw it on drinks. Throw it on, you know, playing games as we call Jua and so on and so forth, which were ill and his family could not benefit. Now that money he takes, whether a tea vendor or a, a, or a samosa vendor or a, a, a perchun vendor or someone who is selling cigarettes or someone who is selling drinks or whatever he's selling, small thing, a shoe vendor, he gets it through a Paytm, he goes into the wallet, goes to the bank account, he's secure. If he went to the police station, no one will listen to him. In fact, they will put him in at times in the bar, not to have trouble. Now, when he has no money at in hand, what will they lose? What will they take off? He doesn't have money, he's not going to spend on useless activities. He will, that money will go in use of, of people, the family building, building houses, building assets, education, and so on and so forth. So in my opinion, the frameworks which have been launched in the last couple of years, as a reform process, has structured the one GST <coughs> framework. I remember a large number of industrialists who used to meet me at OECD and ABDP meetings. They would say, when we want to invest in India, in one state I am able to pick up my project in one month. In another state I am not able to pick up after eight, nine months also. In the third state I am able to pick up after four, five months because the tax structures are different. Now with one GST, which they understand in Europe and United States, high or low is a separate issue. But at least they have understood, now we don't have to worry, we can go straight forward with the business. And this is where tax compliances, tax relaxations, tax clarity, and various other platform which they've done through the digital structure is a clear cut. And, and my interview in Forbes, which got published on Aadhaar I, about five years back, clearly said that Aadhaar will bring that revolution, which is in fact beyond what in the United States we have social security number. The application of Aadhaar has been increased multifold, mul beyond what social security number used to do in the United States. It is like a social security, but in addition to that, large number of other things which are there encompassed and clubbed with this Allah framework, which is structured. So in my opinion, the Indian economy is for a boom, 9.2% GDP growth rate this current year, which we have just gone by, finishing on March 31st, 9.2%, largest in the world. Next year, the, our, the finance minister has projected 7.5% to 8%, RBI has projected around 8.5%, Various international agencies like World Bank, ADB, and IMF have projected anywhere between 9 to 9.5 percent. I feel if the government of India and Ministry of Finance is able to implement what they have chalked out as plans in the current budget 2020, we should be able to see budget at 11 to 12 percent, keeping inflation at 5.5 percent under control with low fiscal debt spending. In the United States, we have a new Federal Reserve Governor, which was appointed only two months back. Why was he appointed? Because the government in the United States did extensive fiscal spending to the time of almost three times of their GDP is what they spent in fiscal spending in the last two years. Now, it is good. It revived the economy. Everyone is happy in the United States. It was maybe important also. But then it creates an inflationary pressure and disequilibriums the economic framework and even the dollar, a big pressure on the dollar when it goes forward. And that's why they brought in a person who has been a taskmaster of controlling and not being favorable to fiscal spending. India has been able to achieve all this without doing fiscal spending. We did have fiscal spending to the tune of 9.5% last year. But that was because of reallocation of funds and a little bit of because of vaccination. But to a great extent, I would say most of the macroeconomic parameters of India are perfectly smoothened, doing very well. And that will lead us to go forward. But the impediment lies in implementation. I hope the government is able to implement the clear-cut 
things which have been laid out in the budget 2020, which is a pure economic document. And I would say a wonderful document which he has created. Thanks, Amon. I sh I share your optimism completely. I have I've listened to you a number of you are very vocal in the for last couple of weeks in the TV, different TV channels. And I listened to some of them. That I I fully agree with you. With that, okay. I think that uh, I finished my question. Um uh good tip i i transfer to you and then you can open up the floor for 10 15 minutes to if there's somebody got a question for you thank you sir you. Uh, for sharing the thoughts so now i would request uh, the participants to ask any specific questions if they are interested to and then we can uh, close this off over to you uh you Raj. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, Amin, sir. I have a question regarding the NFTs. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, very well. Please go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, regarding the NFT, as, uh, as you told us that all virtual currencies are now tax, taxed at 30%. And if you know that when you mint an NFT, it is minted on a mainframe of that cryptocurrency, let's say Polygon, Ethereum or Solana. So uh, in case in the, uh, the digital rupee comes into the picture, would we be able to transfer those NFTs to digital to be mainframe or can we buy those uh, NFTs uh, going forward in the future with digital rupee? And I know uh, these images are just a, a partake uh, thing because it's a huge uh, landscape in NFTs because further moving forward, it can be transferred to agreements. You can buy properties with that. There's a lot of things that could be implemented in NFT. So how is going to affect the NFTs platform if uh, the digital digital rupee comes into the picture? Yeah, first of all, you know, uh, the taxation which has been levied 30% yes. or even the 1% is on virtual assets. This should be clear. And I'm happy that the finance minister came out in newspapers the next day and said what I said on the 1st February. I was there on television for 15 hours on almost large number of channels from seven o'clock till ten o'clock on that day and i said this very clearly that it's a virtual asset it is not nft it is not virtual currency or cryptocurrency first of all they are part of it yes but it is not what she has said it is said virtual assets, okay secondly when it comes to these currencies or these nfts which are being traded and or crypto products as i call them or cryptocurrencies is known commonly across the globe the cryptocurrency bill when the parliament takes a decision on it we will get a clarity on what will be the fate of all these products firstly secondly would the exchanges would be allowed to run in india or not thirdly would you be allowed to transact or not fourthly is there a legitimacy because recently she came out also at a couple of interviews and said that i have not legitimated any particular currency or product she has really clarified that point that I have not legitimated any currency. I have only said 30% on virtual assets. But please imagine, I gave you this case of Rohini gentleman. This Rohini gentleman was hiding all that money in crypto products. Now, unless you claim that I am transferring it or selling it, this tax doesn't arise. This tax only arises when you claim. Now, most if he has bought crores of worth of these products, now it is not done through bank transfer. He is not transferred from bank account. Otherwise, he would have registered them or kept a logic and local book and so, and so forth. And then he will say, and I'm selling in. Most people who are indulging in some of these activities nowadays for the last one, one and a half year are not buying from legitimate accounts. Please understand that. And if they're not buying from legitimate accounts, then there's no question of taxation because only when it comes to be known, only then you will say taxation. Otherwise, then it is a fraud. Then you're evasion taxes. And then there is a separate whole prathola of income tax rules and regulations for evasion of taxes which comes 30 percent doesn't become the bar there okay 30 percent is minimum plus there will be evasion of taxes and so on and so forth so firstly it's only person honest like you and me who somehow ends up buying some of these products right. because of the investor movement and wants to now sell it and claim it and so on and so forth okay once the digital rupee is there and suppose it is legalized these pro tradings are legalized and these crypto products are legalized by the government then certainly you can use a digital rupee to buy, whether it is in an exchange in India or an exchange anywhere in the world. Most of these exchanges, okay, do not have an origination. You know, this is something which I've been talking in banking also. 
if you go to a bank's website you don't get to see its registered office address so if i want to raise a complaint where do i go to many of them don't even have a registered office address or even some of them have not created branch office address but most of them don't even have it now most of these exchanges you do not know who is the investor who is the one who is launched them where exactly is it housed and this is where the biggest problem with these products is that you do not know it is somewhere in the cloud which you can feel as long as you can log in and log out live from that cloud but the day it goes away you don't know where exactly it is so is it going to affect why it is uh, so is it going to uh, impact the indian exchanges as well that are listed that do proper kycs of the of the clients let's say coin dcx wazirx uh, uh, zepay these are some of the biggest exchanges in india that currently do uh, proper kyc of their clients while they are purchasing cryptocurrency because they do not purchase the cryptocurrency themselves the exchange purchases it and you purchase from the exchange in india very, so is very it going to question be... here please i am happy first right. of all they do your kyc right right but have you done their kyc ah uh, yeah that's a very valid point sir very valid point you understand that's what i am saying when talking of these exchanges you yes. see you come to me and i want to sell you something i right. do your kyc i take all your documents very good you right. feel that i have done all your kyc but what is that legitimate power which has given me this power to run this exchange ah right you are right have you done my kyc is this is right. where we are trying to tell the investors from time to time from 2016 onwards that there is no legitimacy in them so what are you doing kyc for in fact you are giving documents to organizations which have no base no originality no legality in any framework so you should be cautious of giving your documents you know rbi says don't give your aadhar card pan card to anyone and here you are giving it to everybody who has no genuinity so oh, no. first right. of all if this cryptocurrency bill only allows them then they will certainly get registered like if you remember we had commodity exchanges in india before mcx and others came in you will be surprised before mcx came in or other exchanges came in like the ncdx and all there were over 24 large commodity exchanges in this country existing they were proper members like mandis you know you have mandis in india for farm so they were like mandis or trading in all kind of products but they were not legal entities there was no legal entity like that they were running it like association of persons at least they were registered as association of persons these exchanges are not even registered as association of persons so what are you giving your legal documents as ask this question to yourself you know when a bank comes and questions you any time ye document this document this document i ask can you give me your legal entity document please right you're asking me for so many documents right. and recently we raised a issue yesterday only that you know banks when they give loans to us they charge emi on monthly basis but when we give loan to them what is our saving deposit or deposits in bank what is it it is a loan to a bank or a financial institution they give us save interest on monthly key quarterly or half yearly basis why right is that not a loan to you why is it not giving given you know when i give a money to bank they give me an fdr a statement one piece paper when i take a loan of even 1 lakh rupees they will ask me for 50 documents where is the trust factor where is the genuinity i think we need to understand as investors as consumers as educated class that when someone is asking us for those documents do we have those documents and those structures and those informations for them as well if we do not we should be cautious we should be careful and take precautionary actions of trying to invest and that's why i said it is like a setta you know a trade where you just go about playing you, and, yeah. you know you don't know what will be out there Right, right, right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. Anybody else, please? I have a question. Amal, first of all, I'd like to really compliment you for people like us who are very layman in this field. You have been very, very clear and explicit, and you explained it very well. I have a very fundamental question. When you look at these uh, products. the value is keep on going up and they're going to so high and they perhaps are not investing how is that money is rising and would that bubble burst any day and what will happen to those people who are investing in this if you can just kindly explain to us i i fully appreciate your question first of all you know it is all hypothetical with an expectation of reaping some kind of good benefit you know i always refer to them as products like you know they are trades women trade arms trade in the illegal market 
or drugs which are traded their value go up very high immediately now can we really go about making them legitimate just because their value is there and people have invested money in that kind of an activity arms trade is a very common arts you know you have art paintings a, a, a component which is used extensively for money laundering across the globe large number of studies have shown that that also value today at 10000 tomorrow at 1 crore rupees i remember someone mentioning not to name that one particular art of a cabinet minister's wife long back was sold in new york for 2 billion dollars now imagine it was it a payment to for that art or what is the payment to someone else for something else is different so these products because you have created a scare oh this is very rare you are going to jump and get huge money creating stories or oh, a student has been able to take out his fee people have been able to take out their fee and structures and so and so forth so you should go about buying people get invested in like in chit funds like we saw some of the well based companies who actually created this chit funds across the country and taken people poor people's money saying that we will give you double triple triple or four times your money or what it is there so these are those kind of structures please understand there is no genuine because if there is a value where is it available why can't i see it who is guaranteeing that value who is creating that value like i said for petro dollar after we our uh, work the venezuela launch the petro dollar they said it will going to be based on the petroleum reserves venezuela has and that was okay because if they have it then it is fine but then after some time it has found they don't have reserves at all when they don't have reserves at all then there is a, there's the underlying variable has gone away so something has to derive value from somewhere when i go for a job i say i want 10000 rupees for my services now i will deliver some goods and services for that now where is my value coming from when i buy a life insurance product you know everybody of us have life insurance product many of us use it as saving instrument but many of us have life insurance product for real purpose so i am going to value my life my life is valued at 1 crore rupee or 50 lakh rupees or 10 lakh rupees or 5 lakh rupees if i say i my value of life is 50 crore rupees and i want to pay premium and die tomorrow with the life insurance corporation or any other insurance corporation give it to me no they will do a valuation of me how are you giving getting your value at 10 crores so there has to be a valuation of an asset which becomes the intrinsic value of that asset like we have for companies whether it is based on stock market valuation whether it is based on the balance sheet valuation whether it is based on the asset valuation n number of ways of valuing there is no way to go about valuing this this is all hypothetical created based on sentiments of people based is hypes you go to any channel today you go to youtube today watch anything the first thing you see is a crypto ad you go to any particular mode you see the crypto ad. where are they getting the money from who is sponsoring some of these products is it a clear cut case i remember when ipl games was there a one full page article came in economic times when ipl was initiated as games these teams are there but no one knew is who, who is holder of these teams there was a face like maybe the ambani team was there or x person or y person or z person but the total share holding of that group was only 2 3 4 5% where was the 95% coming from and this particular one fuch pale article on economic times raised this very beautiful question that who is the equity holder of these teams needs to be brought into check if you really want to have this kind of a trading of cricketers take place cricketers had value and that's what they was being valued there and that's what valuation was there these products have no value so that's where my suggestion and recommendation is please don't go up by something going up and down women have been selling arms have been selling children have been selling unfortunately in the unorganized market it happens across the board across the country slavery has been part of it also drugs have been selling arms have been selling official arms market is different unofficial arms market is different so please understand just because the valuation is there does it become legitimate or structured or it has some potential is not the way we look at it like we saw recent example of oxygen cylinder or oxygen about a year and a half back which was acquired in delhi and other states lack of oxygen cylinders and oxygen oxygen concentrators a product which was officially valued by prominent companies at 10 15000 rupees was selling for 1 and 1/2 lakh 2 lakh rupees 
one person was also caught with this kind of framework and the product did not even work now does that mean that it is a legitimate market just because a 10000 rupees product is selling for 1 crore 1 lakh 2 lakh 10 lakh rupees this is what we need to understand that wherever and this is what i tell most people when i teach even my class that if you are getting abnormal profits then please be cautious because normal business can never give abnormal profits it is once in a lifetime you can have abnormal profits from normal business they can be like you know you do some r and d and certainly something goes up and so your valuation tremendously goes up like we see some of these unicorns becoming very big unicorn because it has picked up but otherwise if something is giving consistently higher profits and they showing that they giving consistently higher profits high huge volatile profit clearly there is something wrong somewhere you should be cautious whether it is stock markets whether it is real estate whether it is any other asset class which you may look thank you give sir anybody else would like to ask anything sir with this we can uh, close this webinar and i on behalf of a member of council of smes feel honored to propose a word of thanks to all the esteemed delegates guest speakers for gracing today's webinar and sharing their valuable insights uh, with us thank you to all the participants and audience for their presence and involvement it has been a great pleasure we look forward to seeing you at our future program thank you very much aman sir and ashok sir a special thanks to you both for bringing out this webinar and giving us in insightful thank you so much sir thank you namaskar thank you thank you all bye thank bye. you ashok thank you very much yes. thank you bye thank you thank you